amazing, huh? Nada, nada, nada. Take it. Don't lose it. No. Okay, just come here, please. You have to change your topic. One, two, three, you're giving statement. Thank you. Thank you, you're addressing yes. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Maria Neira, and I am the director of the Department of Public Health and Environment at the World Health Organization. And uh, believe it or not, I will be your moderator this afternoon, because in WHO we decided that we are multitask, and uh, I have been requested to do this moderation. I hope you will understand that I am not a professional one, so please be nice with me. It is a real, real pleasure to have so many journalists on a, on a room when we are talking about health. Health is normally not so attractive to journalists, so it's very good that things are changing, and who knows why there are so many today accompanying us. <laughs> but it's true as well that we have incredible people for the panel this afternoon. And uh, this is certainly uh, the reason why we are even having an overflow room number four, because I understand there is a lot of people who will like to see this event that, as you know, is a COP23 presidency event and is all about the health actions, not the health problems, no, the health actions for the implementation of Paris Agreement. Because as you know by now, and if you don't know, I will tell you, the Paris Agreement, and please keep it secret, is not an environmental treaty. It's a public health treaty, and a powerful one. And we will demonstrate that this afternoon. First of all, it is my great, great honor to introduce the President and Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji, the ones who are hosting this wonderful and warm event in fact, it's so warm, not because uh, of the energy efficiency rules that they are operating in Germany, but it's to welcome our colleagues from the island. Mr. President, Frank Baini Marana, Bula, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really Frank Mbaini Marama, the Prime Minister of Fiji and also the President of COP23, the Director General of the World Health Organization, the Executive uh, Secretary of uh, the UNFCCC, Governor Schwarzenegger. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. You have certainly energized us, certainly energized me. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Bulawinaka. Good and tag and a very good afternoon to you all. We all know that uh, climate change will have an increasingly serious effect on the health of our people and create some serious challenges for our health systems and infrastructure. And I'm pleased to see that in the COP negotiations, health is now getting the priority it deserves because the evidence from the medical and public health community has been building for many years. This particular initiative was uh, uh, discussed between me and the Director General in my office some many months ago, and I'm glad that it has come up to COP23. For a long time, many people didn't see health as something that needed to be treated specifically in our climate negotiations. Yet, the very first article of the UNFCCC treaty, signed in 1992, refers to protecting health and well-being from the adverse effects of climate change. And the right to health is enshrined on the first page of the Paris Agreement. To fulfill that promise, we need to invest in new infrastructure that can withstand what nature will deliver. 
and we need to make our health system stronger and more agile. Climate change is already causing stress in our health systems, so now is the time to fix them. And uh, we must embrace the fact that human health is inherently tied to modern, resilient infrastructure. This challenge hits wealthy nations and poor nations alike, but it is a fact that poorer people live under less protected conditions than the most and the more affluent. So improving health delivery, fortifying existing infrastructure, and extending resilient infrastructure to vulnerable communities are urgent tasks. And those tasks will require financing. This is a massive undertaking for developing countries, in particular, least developed countries and small island developing states. Health risks are also exacerbated by climate uh, events which cause devastation, which we saw in the Caribbean just weeks ago. We in the Pacific and other parts of the world are equally vulnerable to climatic events that put pressure on our health system. In Fiji, we are still recovering from the impact last year of the biggest cyclone ever to make landfall in the Southern Hemisphere that killed 44 of our people and wiped out a third of our GDP and damaged much of our public infrastructure, including health centers. Unfortunately, only a small fraction of international finance for climate change adaptation is for projects that aim specifically to protect human health. And least developed countries and small island developing states will see only a small fraction of that. That is why the initiative we are launching today is uh, so welcome and so important. It is a joint initiative of the World Health Organization, the UN Climate Change Secretariat, and the Fijian COP23 sec uh, Presidency. And its objective is to ensure that we will have health systems that are resilient to climate change by 2030. It also stresses the need to reduce carbon emissions worldwide to protect the most vulnerable. I am uh, especially pleased that this initiative is a true partnership to produce solutions. And I hope a report will come up in the next COP. And it backs that partnership by tripling international financial support to climate and health in small island developing states. The whole point of our holding these meetings is that the world must face the challenge presented by climate change together through collective action. This is one way collective action can be targeted to very specific outcomes. Like our neighbors in the Pacific, Fiji is already experiencing the effects of climate change on health, but we are doing what we can to meet that challenge. Five of the eight objectives of Fiji's national climate change policy seek to reduce the vulnerability of Fiji's population, health systems, and public health environment to the impacts of climate change. Our healthcare center, uh, healthcare sector is currently in a period of rapid growth and improvement. We are building new hospitals and expanding and improving existing ones. We are building them stronger and we are building them better. We are encouraging young Fijians to take up medical careers by giving them full scholarships. We have dedicated significant government resources to making pharmaceuticals available in particular to those in the lower socioeconomic bracket. We have also embarked on a major water project with the collaboration of the European Investment Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and the Green Climate Fund. It will protect our water infrastructure in the greater Suva area, both fresh and uh, fresh water and wastewater against extreme weather events. And it will benefit approximately 300,000 people, nearly one third of our population. It will also provide great access to clean, drinkable water. Friends, as well as his focus on resilience building in the health sector, our new initiative stresses reducing carbon emissions because there is a simpler truth that goes beyond the particular concerns of small island states. The things that we must do to reduce global warming over the long term are good for our health now. The cities with the poorest air quality in the world are in developing countries and are populated by millions of people who live on the edge. 
The poor cannot escape the contamination or afford the routine medical care, so they are condemned to live with declining health. That is why major cities have been trying to reduce uh, pollution for decades, long before we started talking about global warming. We need to push that effort forward for climate and for health. I would like to thank Dr. Tedros for making climate and uh, environment charge, uh, change a top priority for the World Health Organization, and my friend Patricia Espinoza for elevating the relationship between climate change and health to the position it holds now. I also want to give a special welcome to Governor Schwarzenegger. Governor, thank you for being with us today and for your very public commitment to the struggle against climate change. By devoting your energy, your leadership, and the goodwill you have amassed over a lifetime to this campaign, you are making a real difference. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to a thoughtful and enlightening discussion today, and I thank you all for participating and for caring. Thank you. God bless you all. Your Excellency, uh, Prime Minister of Fiji and President of COP23, thank you so much for this very, very powerful uh, message. And, uh, Thanks as well for organizing that meeting in your office with Dr. Tedros and resulting all, all of this, uh, which is fantastic for us today. I have a problem because I know how to say bula, but I don't know how to say thank you. Binaka. 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 So thank you very much for this very, very powerful message. As you rightly say, this is a, a, an event organized by the COP23 presidency WHO and UNFCCC. So it's my great honor now to introduce Dr. Tedros. Well, he has a different name, but he wants us to call him Dr. Tedros, who is the freshly nominated Director General of the World Health Organization. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maria. The room is a bit hot, and it feels like when I visited His Excellency, the Prime Minister in uh, Fiji. <laughs> uh, I would like to start by saying Bula, and also would like to say Veneka for joining us. The room is, is full, and I'm very, very happy to see the interest of uh, everybody here in health and climate change. Your Excellency, uh, Frank Baini Marama, President of COP23 and Prime Minister of the Republic, uh, Republic of Fiji. And I can see also the Prime Minister of Cook Island with us here, I'd like to recognize. And uh, the Executive Secretary, uh, Patricia, and Governor Schwarzenegger, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We depend on our planet for everything we are and everything we have. The air we breathe, the food we eat, and the water we drink. Climate change therefore strikes at the heart of what it means to be human. It increases the risks of extreme weather events such as the hurricanes that devastated several Caribbean islands this summer. I'm proud that WHO has responded to these disasters with our partners by delivering emergency medical supplies, generators, chlorine tablets, and other supplies to alleviate suffering. Apart from the damage to life and livelihoods, we must not forget the damage to mental health that these events cause. But climate change also fans the flames of infectious diseases such as malaria, dengue, and cholera. And it fuels the spread of non-communicable diseases by polluting the air, food, and water that sustain life. Small island developing states feel these effects most 
acutely. My brother, Prime Minister Bainimarama, knows this all too well. In Fiji, there was an outbreak of diarrheal diseases following a drought in 2011. In 2012, there were outbreaks of leptosporiosis, typhoid, and dengue following a flood. And just last year, as His Excellency said, Cyclone Winston killed 44 people and inflicted damages of 1.4 billion US dollars, more than a third of Fiji's economy. Climate change is not a political argument in Fiji and other, other island nations. It's an everyday reality. I will repeat this. Climate change is not a political argument in Fiji and other island nations. It's everyday reality. <laughs> These communities need assistance to cope with a world that's changing in front of them. Assisting them means assisting us. But despite years of talk, the international response remains weak. Less than 1.5% of international finance for climate change adaptation is allocated to health projects, and seeds receive only a fraction of that. It's time for change. That's why today we're delighted together to launch with the presidency and UNFCCC this special initiative on climate change and health in small island developing states. The initiative aims to give small island developing states the resources and support to understand and manage the effects of climate change on health. Our vision is that by 2030, all small island developing states will have health systems that are resilient to climate change. But it's not enough simply to ask these communities to adapt. We must also take action to mitigate the causes of climate change. So by 2030, we also see a world in which countries around the world will be reducing their carbon emissions. This will protect the most vulnerable from climate risks and deliver large health benefits in carbon emitting countries. The initiative has four main goals. First, to amplify the voices of health leaders and political leaders in small island developing states to engage nationally and internationally. Second, to gather the evidence to build the business case for investment in climate change and health. Third, to prepare for climate risks through preparedness and prevention policies and to build climate-proof health systems. And fourth, to triple the current financial support for climate and health in small island developing states. We will also aim to lead the way in transforming health services in small island developing states away from expensive models of care that focus on treating the sick to those that prevent this and promote health. Ladies and gentlemen, we're doing this for the small island developing states because they will disproportionately bear the burden of climate change. And that's exactly what we're observing. Leaving no one behind means that we are all accountable to those whose voices are not heard the loudest and whose interests are the most easily ignored, which we're observing. But this is not just for the small island states. The whole world is affected by climate change, although the small islands are disproportionately affected. We're all in the same boat. This initiative is for all of us. We cannot improve health and well-being without addressing climate change and without solidarity. I thank you. Vineka. And finally, I would like to thank his presidency uh, for his hospitality when I visited him in Fiji. And also my uh, sister, uh, Patricia, for her leadership, and the governor also for his uh, leadership. It's the commitment of all these leaders that really brought us together today. But this is just a commitment. The action starts, and let's commit to make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. We promise you that from WHO point of view, the action starts and will be scaled up as much as possible. Thank you as well for reminding us uh, about this special initiative. For those of you who are interested in learning more about the initiative, at 1445 in room seven, there will be a side event where many of the ministers represented here and presidents and prime ministers will be there to give you more details about the initiative. And now uh, the third organizer of this uh, special side event, UNFCCC, the, the, the person of the day, the one who will be running now with a great responsibility and leadership, Patricia Espinosa, cuando quieras. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for that very generous introduction. But actually, I believe that uh, the people of the day are all of you. It's uh, our work just to put a platform in place. And uh, however, that does not have any meaning without your presence, without your commitment and your participation. And thank you, um, Director General Dr. Tedros Pedrito for the, for the Latin uh, friends. Um, I do commend you not only for your work related to climate change and health in general, but um, particularly for this initiative that uh, you're launching today, which will have a significant impact on the health and well-being of those living in small island states, which are uh, very much affected by the effects of climate change. A big thank you to Prime Minister Bainimarama for being part of that initiative for your leadership in this process, for accepting to take up this uh, enormous challenge of presiding over this conference. And to Governor Schwarzenegger, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. And not only now, since many, many years, I think you have uh, set many examples in California at the time uh, you were governor that have been an incredible basis to make of that beautiful state uh, one of the leading, leading regions in the world on the fight against climate change. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the health of humanity is directly related to the health of our planet. And the health of the planet of course, is directly related to how we treat our overall environment. It seems like a basic fundamental idea, but as those at the Indigenous Peoples Forum recently reminded me, we seem to have forgotten it. They are right and the evidence is very clear. For example, pollution from fires and the combustion of fossil and solid fuels is resulting in respiratory diseases and millions of deaths, especially children. Overfishing and the warming and acidification of water bodies are disrupting coral reefs and, its, and fish supplies, resulting in food insecurity, disease, and poverty. Extreme weather events related to climate change as we have heard already from um, Prime Minister Bainimarama and Dr. Tedros, um, and as we've recently seen in all parts of the world, are also a significant cause of illness and death. Carbon dioxide emissions caused by human activity are reducing the nutritional content of crops, such as wheat, rice, barley, and soy. It puts hundreds of millions of people, especially those living in Africa and South Asia, at risk for vitamin deficiencies. If we are to correct the course we're currently on, we need to address these challenges in a more comprehensive way. We need a broader view of health, one that directly connects human health with the health of the planet. And we need to understand that by addressing climate change, we can improve health in all areas, 
including those I just mentioned. We can improve the lives of individuals, families, and communities around the world today and in the future. For this idea to be truly effective, however, we need everyone to do their part. We need researchers to develop further evidence on the health effects of environmental change. We need health professionals to educate communities about those changes and advocate for policies that integrate health care and environmental care at the primary level. We need multilateral institutions, such as the UN, the World Bank, and the IMF to help in a variety of ways. This includes monitoring planetary health and advocating for reforms of tax, subsidy, and trade policies that support planetary health. We need national governments to use evidence-based policies to promote human health and prosperity, while at the same time preserving the environment. We need the business community to demonstrate leadership by doing a better job with respect to sustainability and promoting reform throughout the global economy. And of course, we need civil society organizations to develop broad-based public movements for social change. UN Climate Change is working on the issue of climate change and health in several ways, including in our Momentum for Change initiative. This initiative shines a light on some of the most innovative, scalable, and practical examples of what people across the globe are doing to combat climate change. One project called We Care Solar saves lives in childbirth birth by bringing solar power to remote, off-grid, under-resourced medical centers throughout Africa. How? With compact, rocked, and immediately operational solar suitcases. These suitcases provide power for medical lighting, essential electricity, and fetal monitoring for essential obstetric care. We Care Solar has reached more than 2,400 health facilities, and it's an initiative that saves lives. Health workers no longer struggle to provide life-saving care with inadequate and dangerous lighting, such as kerosene lantern, lanterns, candles, and diesel fuel generators. This also significantly improves the health of women giving birth as well as their children. So this is just one example of how addressing climate change is also providing new opportunities in health. But there are many, many more, and there need to be much more uh, happening everywhere around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's clear that addressing climate change is important for many reasons, and one of them has to do with the improvement of health of people everywhere. And every one of us, and those who represent us, can contribute at all levels and in many ways. This is how we will build a cleaner, greener, more sustainable world, and a healthier world as well. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for being here with us. Muchas gracias, Patricia Espinosa, and uh, thank you very much for reminding us the importance for health of all of those interventions. I've been myself one of those doctors trying to support a woman on the delivery room with a kerosene lamp and believe me, something very, uh, quite unacceptable. So if we can change that reality and bring in access to cleaner technology and clean uh, sources of energy, that will be something fantastic. So thank you very much for becoming such an advocate of health and public health. Let me now give the floor to another very strong advocate of uh, health, or at least uh, he will become a fantastic advocate of health. Um, I'm very lucky that I have only to pronounce his name and nobody will ask me how do you spell it because I will be on travel. You know how to spell it, Schwarzenegger? 
Okay, $1,000 for those who can spell it properly. And I'm not including his staff, of course. <laughs> uh, Governor, we are so happy to have you here, and uh, we want to hear from you what do you think about health on the context of climate change. Please, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction. And uh, I want to just say, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the mayor, Mayor Street Hara, who is a fantastic host, and especially the city of Bonn has done such an extraordinary job. So I just want to point that out, because from the moment I came here, I felt really welcome. And I think a lot has to do with the mayor. So let's give him a big hand for the great work that he has done. Mrs. Espinosa, I have known you for many, many years, even when you were the foreign minister uh, in Mexico. And uh, we have dealt with it with various different issues. But you are an outstanding and a rare person because you're so passionate about everything that you do, and especially now about the environment. So to have you on our side is really fantastic. So you're extraordinary. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Dr. Tedros, I want to thank you also, the Director General of the World Health Organization, for hosting this great event here today and for all your tremendous work that you are doing. Uh, outstanding job. Thank you very much for the great work that you're doing. I also want to say thank you to Maria Naira. Um, she's one of those doctors that is, uh, you know, a feisty woman and, uh, and a great, great speaker and very, very passionate about the subject of health. And she's actually responsible for me being here today. And I'll tell you why, because I heard Dr. Naira speak at the Austrian World Energy Summit just recently, it was last June. And I was in absolute heaven when she spoke, because she talked about something that I've been complaining about for years and years and years that environmentalists don't talk enough about, which is health, and which is how many people are dying, and to throw around some of the statistics of how many people have cancer and so on. So she talked about that subject. And I said to myself, wow, this is the first time I hear about this in an environmental conference. So it was like music to my ears. So let's give a big hand to her for the great work that she's doing. And I also want to say thank you, of course, to the Fijian Prime Minister, to Penny Marama, um, for the extraordinary work that he's doing and uh, for the incredible urgent issue that he's putting now, this health issue on the front burner at COP23. So I, I think it's fantastic, the work that you're doing. It's great to see you here. And of course, I have to say, besides your great leadership and your smartness, I love hanging out with you. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, because when he's around, I'm not the only one with an accent. And when he's around, he's not, I'm not the only one that has a difficult no name to pronounce. So uh, we have a lot of things in common here, okay? So it's great to see you. Let's give him a big hand for the great work that he's doing. Now, these annual gatherings of leaders of the world is so important to share information, to inspire each other, and to keep marching forward towards a clean energy future. And I think it's also very important because it's a reminder that even though COP21 was very successful, that the work really never stops. I think it is great to get together like this on an, at an annual level and have those international conferences like this. And I go to a lot of conferences all over the world. And I tell you that the reason why I'm here today is, is because I think that always there's something off on those conferences. There's something off with the communication because for some reason or the other, people don't talk about the health aspect and of what's going on when it comes to health and about how many people are dying. I mean, there's meetings and meetings about keeping the rising temperatures below two degrees. There's presidents and prime ministers that give lofty speeches 
about statistics, about CO2 parts per millions. And there are very intense meetings about the glaciers melting and the polar bears that have a problem jumping from one ice cap to another, and about the levels of the, the sea rising, and all of this stuff that is happening in the future. But no one is talking about what is happening today. There aren't enough meetings about what is happening right now. There aren't enough speeches about people who are dying today because of pollution. There aren't enough conferences about people who die from cancer because they live too close to the freeway or to a port. There are not enough conferences that talk about the kids developing asthma and having breathing problems and having to use an inhaler. So when I heard that I was invited to speak to the, at this event here today, I accepted it immediately. Because this is just exactly what we need to talk about this issue. This is exactly what the doctor has prescribed. This is how we can bring people into our crusade and then march forward in a much more successful way than we have. The fact is that for a vast majority of people, there are much more pressing concerns than temperature increases or polar bears or going, what's going to happen in 20 years from now. It is basic human nature. We are wired through thousands of years of evolution to focus more on a here and now and on survival. Climate change does not move the needle. Rising temperatures does not move the needle. Or what's going to happen in 20 years from now is not going to move the needle. In fact, psychologist and economist Per Aspen Stokness, who wrote a fantastic book on this issue, has found that the more facts that you throw at people, the more they turn away from this whole idea of climate change. He calls our movement the biggest scientific communication failure of all time. And he's absolutely correct with that. It is time that we do better. You can have the best product in the world, but if you can't communicate it to the people, you have nothing. I can do the best action movie in the world, but if I don't know how to communicate to the people to get them into the theater, the movie's gonna die at the box office and it's gonna go in the toilet. So this is why it is so important that we start communicating. It's time that we wake up. It's time that we wake up and talk about what really matters. Here's what matters. The 25,000 people are dying every day because of pollution. 25,000. As a matter of fact, while I'm speaking here today, another thousand will die because of pollution. As a matter of fact, to give you another number, that while but this conference is on these 12 days. Over 300,000 people are going to die, which is the population of Bonn. Think about those numbers. This is what we need to talk about. This is what is important. And I'm proud that the World Health Organization is leading the way by putting the spotlight on this disastrous health impacts of pollution. In fact, today, I want the UN and the World Health Organization to come up with a rule. Now hear me out. I think this is a great idea. <laughs> to come up with a rule that says that no one from now on is allowed ever to speak again about the environment unless they include one page about the statistics of our health problems because of pollution, the death that is occurring. Now you ask yourself, why is he so into this whole thing? Well, let me tell you, we learned the hard way in California. We learned the hard way. See, in 2006, between 2006 and 2010, we did tremendous work in California. Unbelievable. We started making commitments to reducing our greenhouse gases. We did the million solar roof. Uh, we did the low carbon fuel standard and all kinds of things that were happening. Reports called it the most historic effort to battle climate change of any government, national or subnational. As a matter of fact, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon came out to California extra to check it out himself, because he couldn't believe that the state could deliver such unbelievable action. And he invited me then to speak at the opening general session of the United Nations to pump up all the foreign leaders from around the world. Well, let me tell you something. This is what was going on between 2006 and 2010. It was the heyday. 
in California about environmental laws. And then all of a sudden, we, got, we started getting vulnerable because the oil and the coal companies from outside the state came into California and said, enough is enough. You have now passed enough environmental laws and started reducing fossil fuels. Outrageous. We're going to fight you. And we're not going to go to the legislators. We're going to go directly to the people with an initiative. And we're going to tell the people that it is now recession. And we're going to tell them that the economy is going to be ruined and jobs are going to be lost because of this environmental laws. And they spent tens of millions of dollars in California on television and radio. And they had a very simple message. Fossil fuel companies were absolutely relentless. The scare tactics never stopped there. And the message was simple, jobs and the economy. Very simple message. And they get pounding and pounding away. And all of a sudden, we saw the poll numbers that people are going to vote for their Proposition 23, and they're going to wipe out all of the environmental laws. So we fought back. We started raising tens of millions of dollars ourselves. And we started putting on TV spots, one after the next. We started talking about rising sea levels, had no impact. We started talking about climate change, it had no impact. We started talking about national security, it had no impact. No matter what we said, it had absolutely no impact, and the oil companies and the coal companies were going to win. And they're going to wipe out all of our environmental laws. So then, the last month, when the Public Policy Institute came out with the poll numbers and they showed us being way behind, we said, well, we've got to try something different. Let's try something different. What can we try? Then the American Lung Association gave us a little TV spot, and they said, try this. And it was a simple message, pollution is killing us. That's all I said. It was a 15 second spot, we put it on television. A week later, our poll numbers started going up. And the oil and the coal companies' poll numbers started going down. So we said, wow, this is unbelievable. The momentum is shifting, it's in our favor. Let's go and try something else now. And we threw out another commercial, which was from the Academy of Pediatrics. Well, pediatricians debating and talking about how pollution is hurting our children and their lungs and how they have breathing problems that they barely can survive without an inhaler. And the last shot, the last frame of that commercial had a kid with an inhaler <laughs> a freeze. The frame was frozen like that. And let me tell you something. On November 2nd, the people voted, and it wasn't even close. 62% to 38%, the people of California overwhelmingly chose clean energy future. And we said, ask the La Vista to the coal companies and to the oil companies. <laughs> That's right. We terminated them. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yes, so it was not the polar bear, and it was not the ice caps, and it was not the two degree temperature increase, and it was not the sea le level rising. It was none of that. It was simply the children's health, and it was their fear and their worry about dying. That is what did it. And so this is the lesson. This is why I'm saying we are communicating wrong when we always talk about the same thing and throwing around statistics, but we never talk about the amount of people that are dying. Pollution kills more than 9 million people a year. Think about that, 9 million people. It kills three times as many people as HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. It kills 15 times as many people as all of the wars, murders, suicides, and every form of violence. 15 times more. This is a massive tragedy, massive tragedy, and as depressing and as terrifying as it is, we are not talking about it enough. We must talk about it more, and we must talk about it over and over and over. See, in California, we can already see the benefits of this approach. 
We lead the world in clean energy and in reducing pollution because of that. And by the way, everything that the fossil fuel companies said would happen to the economy collapsing and all those things, they lied. <laughs> because our economy in California, we have the strongest environmental laws anywhere in the United States, and at the same time, our economy is booming more than any other state. The United States economy is growing right now at a 2% rate. And the California economy is growing at a 5% rate. Think about that. We are creating more jobs, more revenues, more of everything than any other state. And we have the strictest environmental laws. Not only do we protect the people's lives, but we pump up the economy. So today, I congratulate all of you on your tremendous work at bringing the life and death aspect of our environmental crusade into the spotlight. I want to say thank you to you for doing that, but also I want to inspire you that we work even harder, move even faster, and reach out to even more people. This conference is truly a great start, and I hope that we will have conferences like this all over the world, and you can count on me that I will be there. Because let me tell you something, the World Health Organization is a powerful organization. I've seen what they've done, for instance, in 2003. Maybe a lot of you have forgotten that already because you're so used to their great action. But in 2003, they make that pact with 164 countries to label smoking products, cigarettes and cigars with labels that say this is risky for your health. This may cause a heart attack, this may cause lung cancer, or this may kill you, right? Wouldn't it be great now, and that one, this is a little challenge for the World Health Organization right now, wouldn't it be great if they go and make that same pact with the rest of the world to go and say, let's label now another thing that is killing you, which is fossil fuels. Let's label the fossil fuels. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great when we drive into a gas station and it says that what you will pump into your gas tank may kill you? This will cause cancer. Wouldn't it be great when this oil tanker drives down the freeway and says this contains dangerous materials? What is in there may kill you. Wouldn't that be great? So I think here's a challenge for you guys, okay? Go and make that pact. I want to see that everywhere. And you will see how fast people start reducing fossil fuels. So anyway, thank you very much. Remember, it's our responsibility to hand this world over to our next generation in better shape than we inherited it. That's what this is all about. Thank you very much, and I'll be back. Thank you. Can I say after that, can you imagine a better activist? Thank you for supporting the health argument so well. Uh, I've been trying to influence my husband for many years and I couldn't. I didn't realize that a small conversation will have this result. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, this is amazing. In fact, what you are proposing is that you want WHO to terminate with things at the risk that those things will terminate with WHO. But um, I suppose we can take that risk. And thanks for putting health at the center of the discussion. And thank you very much for reminding every one of us that yes, 12.6 million deaths are occurring every year due to exposure to environmental risk factors that could be reduced, could be modified. So if you can keep that message, that will be fantastic. And it's the action of any of us that will now move on. If we compete on the accent between the two of you, I'm the winner. So don't worry about that. 
Okay, it is, uh, I have to announce that the uh, um, governor has to leave at 10 past 2, and I have now another very exciting panel to, to come in. So can I please request you to move to the front door, and can I ask my panelists now to come here, please, and a big applause to this uh, incredible bunch of panelists. Okay, wonderful. We go now to the second part of this uh, exciting panel. You will see that uh, there is a lot of energy as well in this uh, second part, uh, starting maybe by the, the people coming from the island. And uh, we have with us the Honorable Nandi Glassy. He's the Minister of Health, the Justice, and Parliamentary Service of the Cook Island. And we have the Prime Minister as well with us. A few weeks ago, uh, at the request of our Director General, I went to the Cook Island and to attend uh, uh, the, ministers, uh, the Pacific Ministers of Health meeting. And I was very, uh, very impressed by the fact that not only did they have very high level discussions, but they, they were kind of competing among themselves of uh, which island among all of them is the paradise. So I offered then my services as somebody with some public health knowledge to do this comparative assessment and coming up with a result. I'm still waiting for the invitation to do that tour and, and come up with which one is the real paradise. I'm sure that the competition will be very, very high. So it is my great honor now, Minister Glassy, please tell us what is happening with climate change and health in the island. Thank you. It's a pity that the governor is not here because I was going to remind him uh, that, of course, I'm the Terminator. <laughs> His Excellency, the President-designate of uh, COP23 and the Prime Minister of Fiji, Bula. WHO Director General, Dr. Detro Tedros, a UNF Triple C Executive Secretary, uh, Patricia Espinoza. Uh, and also, I want to acknowledge the, my Prime Minister, the Honorable Henry Puna and Mrs. Puna, and the delegation all the way from the Cook Islands. Kia ora. <clears throat> and also, uh, my other colleague ministers from around the Pacific uh, are also here as well. First of all, on behalf of the 22 Pacific Island countries and territories, I'd like to express my heartful gratitude to the Director General, Dr. Tedros, and of course, Patricia Espinoza, for launching the special initiative on health and climate change in small island developing states. In August this year, the Cook Islands took over from Fiji the role of chair at the 12th Pacific Health Ministers meeting. 
and which is a biannual gathering of health ministers for the 22 Pacific Island countries and territories. So at this COP23 presidency events on health, I'm sincerely honored to represent not only the Cook Islands, but also the whole Pacific countries and areas. As His Excellency the Prime Minister, Pani Marama, mentioned at the opening, Pacific Islanders are already affected by the adverse impacts of climate change on populations' health and health systems. Climate change is adding another dimension of public health to the existing burden of non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, and infectious diseases. We call it the triple burden of diseases in the Pacific. Mortality rates from non-communicable diseases are among the highest in some Pacific Island countries. These have been uh, over 40 large infectious disease outbreaks in the Pacific region in the past five years. Most of them were outbreaks of climate sensitive diseases such as dengue fever, chikungunya, and Zika virus infections. In addition, we have suffered from several record-breaking extreme climate events in the Pacific recently. Extreme weather, uh, weather events fortified by climate change is destroying our precious health facilities. This means that essential health services are disrupted when they are needed most urgently. For example, in 2015, tropical cyclone PAM damaged 90%. That means 21 out of 24 uh, of our health facilities in an affected province on the island of Vanuatu. The economic impact was estimated to be more than 60% loss of their GDP. In 2016, tropical cyclone Winston damaged almost of one third, that is 66 out of 210 of all health facilities in Fiji. And the economic loss was more than 20% of Fiji's GDP. Both of these recent cyclones were category five cyclones, which were unprecedentedly uh, strong in the Southern Hemisphere. Meteorologists say that we will see this type of devastating cyclones and other extreme weather events more and more in the future due to climate change. Most Pacific Island countries have already completed their vulnerability assessment and developed national climate change and health action plans. Thank you to WHO for the technical support in the past several years. However, we need financial and, tech and technical support to implement these national action plans. The Paris Agreement is not only an important climate treaty, but also a milestone public health treaty from the viewpoint of Pacific health ministers. It recognizes the importance of addressing loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of extreme weather events. All change impacts are potential loss and damage that should be addressed. Then which loss and damage can be more important and serious than the loss of human, being, human life and health and damage to life-saving health infrastructure? I want to give you a number for you to remember. The Pacific Islands region as a whole accounts for only 0.03% of the global emissions of CO2 from fuel combustion. Historically, we kept a very humble lifestyle, making almost very little carbon footprint. With abundant solar and uh, wind energy, Pacific countries and territories such as American Samoa, Cook Islands, Niue, Tokelau, and Tuvalu 
will use 100% renewable energy by 2020. So let me ask you a moral question for you to take home. Is it fair for the Pacific Islanders to, uh, to fall sick or die prematurely due to climate change while they are the last ones who contributed to the root cause of climate change? We all know the polluters pay principle. Then who should finance the cost of adapting the impact of climate change on health and health systems in our small island developing states. The Paris Agreement prioritizes sits a small country, a small island state, for efficient process for financial access. Unfortunately, we have not seen any major climate financing provided to the health sector of the Pacific Islands so far. That is why Pacific Health leaders were united at the Pacific Health Minister's meeting to make a special request to DCF for simplified and efficient application and approved procedures, as was mandated by the, Pacific, uh, by the Paris Agreement. We are requesting that WHO should be the entity of GCF to help us access the necessary financial resources as soon as possible. Thank you. Would you like me to repeat that again? Yes, <laughs> the message is loud and clear. And in this context, Pacific Health leaders will enthusiastically welcome the Special Initiative on Health and Climate Change in small island developing states of WHO, UNFCCC, and Fiji Presidency of COP23. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity to deliver the voice of the health ministers of the Pacific Island countries and territories. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you as well for this moral question that certainly I will not answer, but I have an answer personally. Uh, let me now move to another part of the wall, but it's still one of the seeds and uh, with a very critical message to deliver. We have with us the Honorable John Boyce, and he has been supporting previously in our conference on climate change and health. He's a parliamentarian. He has some pioneer initiatives on legislation. So please, can you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you very much. Minister from Barbados. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me recognize, of course, the President, President, President of COP23, Prime Minister of Fiji, the Director General of World Health Organization, Brother Tedros. And congratulations, sir, on your work so far. Uh, we are especially happy in the region to that you have selected one of our own in Dr. St. John as one of your assistant director generals, and we wish her well. I want also to recognize my colleague speakers for this session and to indicate that I bring you greetings, of course, from the small island of Barbados, 270,000 inhabitants or so, who, of course, on a Sunday evening like this would be enjoying a rum and coconut water at the beach. And so being out here in Bonn working so hard with you is actually surrendering a wonderful past, pa, pastime of our country. Those beaches, of course, are threatened too by the vagaries of climate change. Normally in, in our uh, legislature, if we have such powerful speeches as would have gone before from our keynote speakers and just now from my colleague from the Cook Islands, we would ask the speaker that we should take a vote and that we would bring the session to an end and we would accept and, and, and vote in favor of the resolution and proceed to action. However, 
I feel it is my duty to say a little bit about Barbados and about the Caribbean in terms of how climate change has affected us and how climate change, like has been made clear, actually threatens the health and well-being of our countries. There is a saying in the region that God is a Barbadian. Of course, we, we know better than that. God is a world prize for all of us. And indeed, God is a Dominican too. But this year, uh, in the vagaries of Hurricane Maria, Dominica, a colleague, island state would have suffered severe devastation at the hands of that, uh, that, 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 that uh, challenge. Of course, immediately, all of the region would have sprung into action to make sure that we could mitigate some of those challenges. But I can assure you, by, by my personal contact with members of government of Dominica, members of the health sector, the chief medical officer, the challenge is extremely great as they try to recover. And we encourage the Pan American Health Organization, of course, CARICOM, and other uh, regions, the United States, the Great Britain, and other countries who have all been chipping in and have been uh, dealing with a tremendous recovery effort. And the major threat now, of course, besides infrastructure rebuilding, is the question of the health of the children and the people of Dominica. Similarly, in Puerto Rico, uh, Barbuda and Antigua to a lesser extent, Turks and Caicos, all of these small islands have been badly affected. I believe that the way to fight this challenge, of course, is to start with our young people and uh, invest in the future. We often say that this, the, 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 the policies which we are adopting and what we are putting in place today, yes, they will benefit us, the adults of the population today, but they are, as one of the speakers made the point to, this is an investment for the future in recognition that we will leave this world a better place for our children than we found it. So we have invested very heavily in our youth program and in making sure that at the primary level, the teachings of good health, the teachings of good practices vis-a-vis -vis the care of our environment are ingrained in our children. Another very important aspect of our work has been the recognition that is, be, is getting stronger and stronger that this cannot be a department of health approach only. It cannot be a department of the environment approach only, but it really has to be an approach which embraces almost every aspect of our government in our countries. And certainly areas of education and training, the social services, of course our ministries of finance, our ministries of works who help to build our infrastructure. All of these decision makers have to be part of the thinking as we go forward to build a resilient environment in which we can assure our populations of a healthy future. And public education, as I mentioned, should also be part of a community focused action program so that we build programs which will see leaders and decision makers and technical uh, officers moving into our communities and helping our people to understand how much they can contribute and how much they can do to make sure that that, uh, that, that, that policy is put in place. So we have, a, we, we, we have a, 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 a full approach in Barbados to the, the, the battle for uh, for improving the life of our people and for reducing the threats of climate change. And as I said, it is one which recognizes the contribution of everyone and every decision maker in this regard. Information too must be one of the tools which we must take seriously in addressing almost any type of health crisis. And disease surveillance and relies on data that we can obtain from our doctors, from our hospitals, 
or laboratories through formal or informal reporting systems. On Monday evening in Barbados, we opened a, it was t entitled the Zika Tech Camp. Uh, this was sponsored by the Embassy of the United States in Barbados and the CARFA, CARFA, the Caribbean Public Health Agency, which is located in Trinidad and Tobago. This tech camp was an, is an initiative to try to promote, intended to help communication and health promotion specialists to more efficiently use media technologies when communicating with target audiences about any diseases or epidemics in the region. We are aware of the dynamic changes in respect to the informa how information is released and how quickly it's disseminated using email, internet, uh, social media programs, and of course, the now famous Twitter, which we, we believe we, we, we must bring on board and get it our message out. Social media, therefore, social media-based surveillance will not be a replacement for surveil su uh, traditional surveillance as such, but can be used to enhance, it can be used to enhance, thereby serving to improve the capacity of information related to outbreaks and the successes of our treatments. So that we believe that all of these, all of these approaches will help us as a region to fight, uh, to help to make our case, to help to educate and train our people to put in place uh, important, efficient programs that will see us being able to manage what is really a very serious human threat. I think all of the speakers this afternoon have made it very, very clear how urgent this message is and how important it is that we understand. I am not bringing a message that says that the region of the Caribbean, Barbados, and our, 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 our sister nations have necessarily done everything right so far. But we have been guided by the Pan American Health Organization, the World Health Organization's work, and we've followed some very serious practices and, 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 and important practices that they've put in place. We have been served by some very well-trained technical personnel, of course, and we will continue to emphasize the importance of having on the ground the capacity, the capacity to work and to improve the health options of our countries. And certainly, in terms of legislation, we have, of course, passed the, 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 the Tobacco Labeling Act in Barbados, and we do not allow smoking in public places anymore, and we believe we're going to get tougher even with that, because I'm not satisfied that the demarcation of not smoking in public places is sufficient. Uh, in 2015, we introduced our uh, sweet drink taxes, which are aimed at imposing some uh, tax penalties on the distribution of uh, sweetened, sugar sweetened beverages, so as to reduce the demand for them. Similarly, that kind of legislative approach will help us to fight the environmental impacts which affect health in our region and in our country. So I believe that we have good examples which to follow. We continue to learn from our experiences here at WHO and uh, PAHO in the region, and we look forward and are uh, very grateful that we could I could join this conference this evening, share with the information that was dissipated, and indeed say a little bit about our program in Barbados and the Caribbean region. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a terribly bad uh, moderator because we are very late with our schedule. But of course, the issue is so important that uh, I recognize that we need to dedicate more time. We have today with us another minister he, who might feel a little bit isolated because he's a minister of climate and environment, and he's surrounded by the health people. 
but he is doing already a lot of health, particularly Norway has been very much involved on the climate change and health, but on the climate and clean air coalition, on the short-lived climate pollutants. So, dear Minister Vidar Helgesen, can you please tell us, from Norway, can you please tell us your experience and how Norway is supporting this? Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, as a Norwegian, I may not only feel uh, isolated being a climate minister, but also a Norwegian among all these small island uh, states. I didn't surrender coconut juice to come here. But um, we have uh, major things in common. We are human beings, uh, whether you're from the South Pacific or the Caribbean or uh, from the Arctic. Uh, we all live with uh, the fact that climate change does impact health. And indeed, for uh, Norway, the issue of uh, climate and clean air is very important, not least because black carbon or soot is uh, um, a very important contributor to uh, climate change. And when uh, uh, black carbon and short-lived carbon, uh, short pollutants are released, uh, in the high north, the closer to the Arctic you get, the stronger the impact is, uh, because when it lands on uh, snow and ice, it has ripple effects uh, that uh, are strong contributors to climate change. Um, and the sources of uh, that also have strong impacts on uh, health. And this is why Norway, since the 90s, have been very mindful of um, cutting um, these kinds of emissions. I think since the 90s we've cut um, black carbon emissions by uh, almost a third. A very important uh, starting point to achieve that was to establish good inventories uh, from the basic observation that what you can measure you can manage. And uh, we've been very happy over the last uh, few years to be able to uh, get the Arctic Council countries, all the countries of the Arctic, uh, and those include some of the biggest uh, countries uh, in the world, to unite behind an ambition that by 2025 we will cut uh, emissions by a quarter to a third compared to 2013 uh, levels. I did say that the sources of uh, black carbon as a source of climate change are also, of course, affecting uh, air quality. And that's because the sources are the combustion engine, uh, particularly diesel, wood stoves, and... Um, as the as two main sources. The way we are going about uh, cutting these emissions for climate change purposes are also yielding benefits uh, for air quality and therefore people's health. That relates not least to electrification. Norway is the country in the world that has the highest penetration of electric vehicles in our uh, car sales. In the biggest urban centers, we're soon gonna be at 50% of new cars sold being electric. It's uh, also an area we're investing heavily in when it comes to coastal shipping. We have already the first fully electric car ferry operational on the west coast of Norway, but in a few years we'll have around 50 car ferries. Ferries are an important part of our road network. Uh, also waterway passenger shuttles, fishing vessels, even coastal cargo vessels, and uh, coming on hydrogen cruise ships as a major investment in uh, greener uh, shipping. Uh, and while the combustion engine is still there, uh, techniques like uh, particle filters have also been very important. And since Norway is a cold country, particularly at this time of year, wood stoves is a very important part. It's not the general heating source, but it's the cozy part of heating, and uh, not least in our cabins, and, uh, but also in a number of homes. And uh, we've been putting in place incentives for people to change and modernize so that uh, um, only clean wood stoves are uh, being used. And in some cities, they're contemplating banning um, old unclean stoves. And I'm also happy that Norway, as the first country, um, uh, is now banning, as from 2020, we put in place the legislation this year, that from 2020 we will completely ban oil heating, 
in buildings, not only private buildings, but also public buildings. Actually, our biggest opponent in this regard is the health sector, because all the hospitals are uh, challenging us on this ban, but we are insisting that they need to find uh, alternatives. There will be some narrow exceptions, uh, but uh, it is important that uh, also the health sector actually takes responsibility for uh, air quality and uh, health uh, hazards from their own operations. So more generally, I would say uh, the issue of uh, black carbon is an example that uh, climate change, health, uh, climate change, pollution and health are very much related. We uh, often put that as a phrase, as the phrase, what is good for your body is good for the earth, and what is good for the earth is good for your body. That relates to the quality of air, it relates to the quality of water, it re relates to uh, the quality and the composition of uh, diets. Uh, so in climate mitigation, we also find much that uh, will lead to better health, and uh, not only to a better uh, climate, because better, healthier food production, better energy systems and better transportation systems will yield benefits in the short run for the health and in the long run for the climate and the environment. Thank you. No, we have been allotted a little bit more. Thank you. Yes. That was a reminder that we are late, but it's okay. Um, thank you so much, Minister. And um, I'm playing the TS, you know the TS? Teflon strategy. So you, you, we received the message, but we need to kind of carry on a little bit more because we still have very important presentations. And the next one, and thank you very much, Norway, for demonstrating one against your leadership on this one. My pleasure to introduce Her Royal Highness, the Princess Sarah Said of Jordan. She's a, a very strong advocate on global maternal and newborn health, and she will tell us about the connections between climate change and that. Thank you. Excellencies, colleagues, friends, firstly, my appreciation and deepest respect to His Excellency the Prime Minister and the Fijian delegation who have worked so hard with urgency and necessary determination to make this con conference the success it has to be, and to the Government of Germany and City of Bonn for their kind hospitality. The human face of climate change is as tangible as it is unaffordable. Everyone will be affected, but not equally so. Women and men experience disasters differently. Inequality in the routines of everyday lives drive profound differences in risks, exposure, and survival. And the graver the localized gender inequity, the greater the difference. When climate impacts are rapid in onset, for example, the outcomes for women and children are exceptionally severe, with women and children being 14 times more likely to die than men. The gendered differences in impact are largely the result of the differences we ourselves create through the social roles we play and the social expectations of how we should behave. In disasters, women die because under force of the social norm that when outside the home, they be accompanied by a male family member, they do not flee early or fast or far enough. The particular role that women play in the care of children and the elderly further slows their escape. Their lack of opportunity or permission to practice such protection activities as the ability to swim or climb a tree all account for the extraordinary differences in survival rates. Where women are the primary caregivers of family, they also shoulder the greater burden of managing and cooking food, collecting drinking water and taking care of livestock. Climate change disrupts every element of these daily tasks and lives, making them harder, longer, and increasing women and girls' vulnerability to risk. Women offer a wealth of capability for individual and community survival before, during, and after disasters. Adolescent girls have the capacity to be energetic and influential proponents of disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation in their families, schools, and communities. And yet, time and time again, we neglect or undermine the specificities of their need 
and the value of their role as first responders who bind families and communities and ensure their health and well-being. This neglect has profound negative effects which continue across generations. The World Bank recently issued a report on the shockingly large and often hidden impact of drought, which wipe out enough produce to feed the population of Germany. 81 million people every day for a year. The report highlights girls born in rural Africa during a severe drought, who as a result are more likely to grow up poor and hungry, be less educated, stunted, wed younger, give birth to underweight babies, and bear more of them, a poverty trap created by a single episode of drought. Dear friends, more and impactful answers to climate change will come if we change the climate, particularly with regards to women and girls. This demands from the international community, country leadership, and technical experts a wholehearted shift of course the services and assets, policies and practices needed for dignity and health, particularly sexual and reproductive health, for every woman, every adolescent, every child and every newborn, in all circumstances, are not luxuries, nor are they ideologies. They are universally life-saving, life-changing, life-enhancing, dignifying human necessities. They are the platform high, firm and solid, on which we can build policy response and programmatic interventions that will help us rise above the unwelcome tides of climate change. And this is exactly what happened in the Pacific in 2015. Hosted by Fiji, supported by UNFPA and WHO, with the full and active participation of all of the Pacific Island countries, UN agencies and programs, NGOs and community leaders, the Kyla was born and adopted. A united shout to strategically advance risk reduction and preparedness through key policy directions to improve communities' resilience to climate change through reproductive, maternal and child health. Active, engaged and prepared communities are the door to success. And communities that fully incorporate the contribution of its women, young people and children have the key. Thank you. Thank you so much, Princess, for this beautiful call and powerful one to remember about women and girls. Thank you very much. Let me now invite uh, one of the key pieces of this equation is access to clean fuels, to clean energy. And it is my pleasure and my honor to invite Rachel Kite to tell us she is the CEO of the Sustainable Energy of all, for All and the Special Envoy of the Secretary General, Sustainable Energy for All. So, Rachel, please, what about energy? Some Honourable Prime Minister, Honourable Ministers, uh, Director General of WHO, uh, friends, colleagues, and Maria. Um, I, a lot has been said, and, and I know that we're running late, so I just want to focus on three particular uh, pieces of what has been, I think, beautifully explained today as a, a 360 degree issue. And, and look at these from the perspective not only of the harm that we are, as the governor, Governor Schwarzenegger said, you know, ignoring to our own detriment, but also because they are opportunities for change and they are systemic changes that if we are able to um, make a difference and leave no one behind in these particular aspects of the health and climate change nexus, um, we could spur change at a, at a speed and scale which has been um, beyond us uh, up until now. The first is cooking. So if you look around the room, um, every third person in this room, uh, if you were a microcosm of the global population, would not be able to prepare a meal for your children without risking poisoning them. It's 2017 and 2.8 billion people face a ridiculous challenge every day of jeopardizing their children's health, jeopardizing their own health, um, in order to be able to put food on the table. Um, now, there's a, we know a lot about why that is now, and a lot has been done to try to keep this issue at the forefront 
um, of the development challenge, of the challenge for the rights and equality of women and girls. Um, it's a public health issue. It's an energy issue. But we now know so much that we should be able to, um, we should be able to build big markets for clean fuels for those 2.8 billion people. You know, I remember when I was little that uh, in the United Kingdom we moved from coal to gas and people came round household by household and explained how a gas cooker was going to work and you shouldn't be afraid of it. And then um, once you'd got your gas bill, then they gave you the cooker with it. So this is about stoves, this is about technology, it's about women's access to technology, but it's really about building markets for clean fuels for 2.8 billion people. I'd like you to join me to build those markets over the next 13 years and improve the health of those 2.8 billion people and in so doing show that there is, in fighting climate change, better health, better uh, cooking, better livelihoods, more time for women to spend doing other things. The second aspect of this is electricity. So we have clean fuels and we need clean electricity. And here there's a huge challenge for the healthcare sector. Only a quarter of healthcare facilities in sub-Saharan Africa actually have access to reliable energy. If you don't have access to reliable energy, affordable energy, clean energy, then you have a very hard time running a successful health service. The Director General knows more about this than anyone else in the room. And so turning this from a problem to a solution and making the health service uh, a leading proponent of, in many cases, distributed, off-grid, renewable energy and allowing health services to be not only the hub for health but the hub for electricity provision in a community which doesn't have access to reliable, affordable, clean energy right now is going to be the way to go. And we see lots of innovation, but we're not yet at scale. And I think there's an opportunity over the next year to two years, and with this initiative now giving this a prominence that we've not had up to now, there is a way to put the, de the demand for health service in the forefront of what would actually be then a way to close the energy access gap cleanly. People will, as the governor said, demand that their children's health is protected before they will demand energy services. And we can bundle the two together. The third thing I want to talk about is something that hasn't been talked about yet. This planet is warming and people are moving into cities around the world that are getting hotter and hotter. And we are having to build more and more and more refrigerators for us to live in as our cities become ovens. We have a crisis of cooling. We have to be able to provide ambient temperature control for people. We have to be able to cool medicines and vaccines. And we have to be able to cool food to protect its safety. We have to be able to do that in a super efficient way if we are not going to explode energy demand over the next 10, 20 years. We have to do that without F gases, HFCs, controlled under the Kigali Amendment of the Montreal Protocol. And we have to do it for everyone. We cannot expect our cities to be uh, productive. We cannot expect families to be able to protect themselves. We cannot expect health to improve or economies to improve if we don't have access to that cooling. So I'd again invite you to join us in finding ways to provide F gas free, super efficient cooling for all something that can be done with technology and business and investment over the next 10 to 15 years. Another reason why the healthcare community will be at the front of the climate change challenge. I want to say one final thing as Maria gets up. <laughs> is that you've heard over the last two to three days and you will hear tomorrow the oil and gas, the oil and coal industry posit the idea that they hold the solution to the one billion people who don't have access to electricity and that they can provide the solution to the 2.8 billion people who don't have access to clean cooking. The idea that carcinogens and pollution is what people who don't have access is demanding is demeaning of those poor people. People who don't have access want access to reliable energy. They want access to affordable energy and they want access to clean energy because they worry about their kids' health as much as you and I do. And I think that the healthcare community has to take on this lobby vocally with the data and with the evidence and I will stand with you as you do so. Thank you.
And we take this challenge. We need a healthy energy, energy transition. We are ready for that, Rachel. Thank you very much. I'm extremely concerned about the timing, but we still have to hear from a mayor. And it's a mayor who uh, is uh, from South Africa, but they have an incredible role to play as well if we want to propose this healthy urban planning in places where we can tackle the causes of climate change and air pollution. Please, Mayor, you have an invitation to be very short, but very strong and smart and positive. Please go for it. I'll take about two minutes and nothing more. I'll cut five minutes by observing all protocol as we do in Africa. We never mention everybody that needs to be mentioned. <laughs> Let me begin by saying that it is the poor that suffer at the end of the day, more than everybody else. Presidents jet off to Western countries to get health, um, their health inspected. It is the poor that are finding themselves drinking dirty water every day and dying every day. It is the poor that wake up dead or their shakes burning because of their sleeping next to a coal-fired heater. It is the poor that die each and every day, or children that are born with uh, um, disabilities because of the environment that we find ourselves living in. More and more people in Africa now are dying of cancers that cannot be explained. But there is an explanation. An explanation is that we need to do something with the environment before Mother Nature acts harshly than what he has, she has been. In Swan, we've taken a step to then ensure that each and every building that we are now building going forward has to have a four-star, minimum four-star green, uh, green um, um, uh, um, graded. We're doing retrofitting in all our buildings, and we need to make sure that by, 20, by 2030, all the municipal buildings or all government buildings need to make sure that at least they have a three star, ensuring that the quality of life is also improved. We are now ensuring that we are changing also the buildings around the city that used to be old offices, because we want to move people that are now or that apartheid left them living far flung outside of the city who have to spend 60, 70 percent of their salaries transporting themselves to places of work. And those that are still living in the outskirts, we're ensuring that now we're introducing um, uh, compressed natural gas buses to make sure that we are able to then bring people safer um, to places of work, to places of play, to schools and all of that. We are now introducing um, what we call the, 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 the bio toward which is now an, another renewable source of energy where we are now beginning to also use cow manure to manufacture German vehicles. BMW in South Africa, which is situated in our city, is now using that. And we are saying that we now need to do all those things. We need to produce cleaner air. We need to produce cleaner energy. We need to make sure that the people that are the poorest of the poor don't have to continue to suffer. So our message is very, very clear from Africa. Africa is no longer here at this international platforms to come and beg. Africa is here to say we need partners. Yes. We need yes. people to work with us. We are here not begging anymore. We are here to say we know what needs to be done. We just need partners to come and work with us as we produce a healthier continent, as we produce a healthier world going forward. Thank you very much. You see? I knew it, I knew it, that he will deliver a very powerful message. Minister of Fiji, you are the, 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 you have the presidency of COP23. I know that I'm supposed to cut, but I cannot resist to give you the floor for again two minutes of inspiring and something very spectacular and thanking all of you. 445, room seven, there is a, 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 another side event on the SEEDS project that uh, Dr. Tedros launched this uh, one hour ago, and you can have more details about that. 4.45, room 7. Minister, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just keep uh, my summary remarks very short. Uh, Director General, um, <clears throat> also acknowledge my Prime Minister 
and of course the UNFCCC Executive Secretary, Governor Swashniga, panelists and excellencies, thank you very much. I think uh, it's been an honor to have a room full of um, delegates and participants for these very important uh, discussions that we've had. Uh, just to round off in a couple of minutes from our Prime Minister, climate change and its um, impacts to health is a reality for us in the Pacific. From our Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros, climate change should not be a political issue, but it is a reality of uh, everyday lives for our small island developing nations. Uh, Patricia talked about our relationship with our environment and of course the health impacts, uh, the risks, diseases and deaths. She talked about advocacy, healthcare and the relationship that healthcare has to have with the environment and of course leadership at all levels if we are to um, make changes. Uh, the governor spoke very charmingly about how we need to fill up all spaces uh, when it comes to climate change and health. Health needs to be an inclusive agenda in any discussions that we have. And uh, of course, my colleague, the chair of the Pacific Health Ministers, uh, Minister Glassy, talked about um, the need for us uh, to tackle this issue because, again, it's a reality for us. And if I may go back to what we experienced in Fiji when we had the um, <clears throat> strongest uh, TC Winston affecting our people, 40 people lost their lives, 40,000 plus lost their, lost their homes, and of course it had a great impact on our, our bills. So it's, again, reality. It's reality for us. And the discussions this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, have been encouraging. It has also been disturbing, but there are lessons to be learned. And one of the biggest lessons to be learned is that we need strong leadership and we need leadership and of course the time to talk has now gone away we need to act we need to act because climate change is impacting the very survival and livelihood of our people not only in the pacific but i think across across the uh, the globe as well um, and um, so over the last 90 minutes it was supposed to be 90 minutes but we extended to more than an hour ago we have learned how climate change and health are inextricably linked and we've heard the threats that climate change poses. Of course, there was um, challenges given to WHO from uh, the governor himself and, of course, uh, my colleague, and I hope that will be taken in. And um, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll agree that we've had a very wonderful discussion this afternoon, and that has been because we have some very eminent speakers who have shared their experiences with us, and they've given us a lot of takeaway home messages that we really need to go and act, and, of course, it's, it's all about actions now. It's all about actions. And we need, if we really need to tackle the impacts of climate change and leave the planet a better place than we found for our future generations, we all need to work together and we all need to act upon the risks that climate change poses on the health of our very people. So with these words, thank you very much. And yeah. Oh, before I forget, the discussions that started in Cook Islands about where the paradise lies, uh, where, which is the paradise of the Pacific, I stand to support Fiji. Thank you. <laughs>